well, this is going to be a bit different. The planner at first was to do something a bit like what they traditionally call a read-along, where someone flips through a book chapter by chapter, comments on things that they see in that chapter, and then talks about it in a sort of controlled way at the end. I was planning to do that, see if there was stuff I liked and wanted to talk about, and while I was doing that, I took some notes. And then the notes needed footnotes, and then the footnotes needed some structure, and then eventually I realized that I had just made myself an outline for a video article, and that's what this became. This is a reading and examination of the game Hardwired Island by Weird Age Games. In the interest of disclosure, I backed this book on Kickstarter, and after the fact, I contributed art to it. I designed the flag of Grand Cross and helped to design components of the logo. Uh, I was not paid for this work, and I asked for my payments to instead be given to an appropriate charity given the events of the time. And I'm friends with the developers. Like, we actually chat about things. We hang out as much as we can in the year of our Lord 2020. Like, we know the kind of anime that one another likes. So we're going to talk about this game, and we're going to do it in a structured way, because I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings, and I need to make sure I'm putting out there in a coherent way. Welcome to Grand Cross. In the distant future of 2020, humanity has spread to space. A meteorite struck Earth's northern hemisphere in 1996. The impact caused widespread environmental damage that humanity has yet to fully recover from, but it supercharged public interest in space exploration. Around the world, new political unions began pouring money into space programs. The result is Grand Cross an O'Neill cylinder in the Earth-Moon L5 point. It's Earth's gateway to the stars, a launching point for missions to Mars and beyond, and a beacon of hope for its people. But it's in crisis. An alliance of space-based corporations known as the Off-World Cartel has moved in. While they sell space exploration as a shared dream they strive for along with everyone else, their true aim is control of Grand Cross, and through it, the future of space settlement, as their influence spreads, so does inequality and crime. The cartel has convinced the current government to privatize many of the systems that keep Grand Cross running, and the station is slowly falling apart. Behind the scenes, they have even more underhanded schemes running in secret. If the next election favors the cartel, they'll be on their way to becoming the landlords of human space. This is the spiel that greets you when you open up. Heart Wide Island. It is a tabletop RPG set on a stable human Earth's based space station. Not orbiting Earth, but at the Lagrange points, which is a science thing, and I've just used the word confidently, so you think I know what it means. And maybe if I spend some time on Wikipedia, I'll be able to tell you what it means. But the point is, it's in a stable orbit. It is also distant enough from Earth that it is able to launch things further into space. That's your basic lot. It is as it were, a kind of last best hope for space exploration, a, a waypoint to the stars, a, a gateway uh, possibly standing on some sort of barrier or threshold on the other side of which could exist any sorts of dominions. But that's not the kind of game this is. This isn't a game about humanity making our first foray into space, establishing a sp stable population up there, and then encountering uh, wonderful, fantastic alien cultures and interesting, diverse political dealings between huge established settlements. This is about us. We went to space, and all we found was ourselves. Specifically, Hardwired Island is retrofuture. The idea is that it is not the now that we could have had, but rather it looks at now through the lens of how we thought now could be 30 years ago. It takes the ideology and visions of 90s anime and then uses that to try and kind of backfill the way that we wound up living and the way we wound up being in our now. As an RPG system, it has what I would probably refer to as a elegant and widely applicable system that wants to use D6s. This is a good thing a lot of indie RPGs do or have to do because people can reliably expect to have D6s around their house as opposed to specialized dice like D20s or dice rolling programs. The system doesn't want you to roll too many dice at once. There is a sort of like a handful sized cap on these things just because of the practicalities of how these things work. And broadly speaking, the system 
sees that range of numbers on a pair of d6s as being a pretty handleable number. So this isn't a game where you're going to be rolling mitfuls of dice for regular actions. A large handful of dice is probably an example of like a story ending kind of tension moment. It is therefore much more about making what actions you can commit to or things you are likely to succeed the things that you can rely on. It also does something that a lot of other books don't tend to do, at least up until recently, where it opens by explaining, hey, here is what we mean when we say cyberpunk. You don't often get in even like big name properties a passage that says, hey, when we talk about this genre, here's what we mean when we look at it. This is really important for this particular type of book because cyberpunk is one of those terms where the applications of it have dulled its use. There's a lot of people talking about cyberpunk and saying it's not cyberpunk. Personally, I really hate this conversation. I think that there's nothing quite so obviously not punk as sitting around demanding other people to find their art to comply with your needs. But, you know... It is a battle that has been lost. And the important thing here is that Hard White Island wants you to know what it means when it says cyberpunk. There is some stuff to talk about that I would guess I would file under textural or quality based stuff. Like, you know, how is this book as a book? Now, I had an e-copy, so I don't have a physical handed, you know, copy to pour through, which means I can't ever test to the printing. But as an actual RPG book, as a PDF, all right, what can we say about that? Uh, first up, it's it's gorgeous. Like, I don't know how many people are likely to make this point when they talk about this game, but this game is beautiful. Uh, it is vividly colorful on every page. It uses its cultural palette, the, the bright cyans and magentas of this particular aesthetic space, as highlight notes, uh, there's art on most pages. There's good, solid iconography. The and like not to blow smoke up my own butt, but the flag design is good. Uh, the characters are depicted in interesting, uh, expressive ways. They aren't just like a standard headshot, mugshot kind of thing. You are getting characters in poses and living in the space and the dynamic positioning of them. There are splash pages. The layout is good. And like overall on a pure like book layout design kind of level, this is easily one of the best indie RPGs I've ever handled. That isn't to say it's perfect. There are typos and some layout stuff, but that's just like, you know, welcome to the nature of small press projects. There are going to be typos. As far as the book's purpose, what it's driving towards... Uh, the vast bulk of this book is about what this world is about. There's uh, mechanical information that's all presented up front very handily, um, but it's also mostly contained to the opening sections. There is more later in the book, but it tends to be much more, hey, here is a thing a character does, and here is a little sidebar or a little bit of mechanical information explaining that. It is less so about the idea of, like, you're not going to leaf through the back of the book looking for faction abilities or special spells. It's mostly just going to be the upfront. Here is the stuff you learned in character creation, and everything else doesn't, doesn't need to be worried about for now. That said, that means that the rest of the book can spend its time talking about Grand Cross as a setting. How it works, what gravity is like, how the day-night cycle operates, the different corporations and their organizational structures. There's short fiction representing individual characters. There is... A deliberate attempt to make this book immersive in the classic sense. It wants you to sit and dig into its fiction and feel like you can belong, like you should be part of this world, that someone like you belongs here, and then it ropes you in. It gives you a place to belong. It lets you feel like you're part of the world. The problems these characters face are like the problems you would face. There is an interconnectedness, a sort of anchoring detail that lets you look at these characters and the world they live in as a hyper-reality of our own. If you're one of the people who it me's at things and you it me at something in this particular book, trust me, you should definitely pick it up because this is the kind of game that's made for the kind of person you are. There is also just like a lot of NPCs uh, with fiction writing that explains their lives and lifestyles, like how they're anchored in the world. It's not just a matter of this person has this job and they earn this much. Um, it's like, you know, a, a day in the life kind of narratives, which give you different character voices, different interpretations, different ways for a character to be in Grand Cross. 
Now, when we talk about games and systems, that usually means what we're looking at is something that a person has made to express ideas. We use the term philosophy engines in my classes about this. The notion that any given rule set expresses something of the creator's philosophy. So what can we look at this book in terms of its philosophy expressed through its mechanics? Uh, first up, I would note that the character creation is very solid. Uh, it doesn't want to spread out very large. It doesn't seem to have a deliberate attempt to expand over a huge number of pages. Uh, everything has a standardized size and it's all reasonably small. It starts with a summary of the process. Then when it comes to the character creation, it's in many games, it's a matter of what dials you can turn, how much detail or how complicated you want the characters to be. Uh, there's also often a lot of reliance on you being able to give the character something, uh, a, a way that the character was born or created or something about that, that that represents an externality or in some cases an inherentness to the character. Like sorcerers from Dungeons and Dragons are characters who inherently have their magic and you get to explain how that works. Um, the character creation system in Hardwired Island as laid out is extremely experiential, um, which is to say that Everything that you go into character creation to make choices about is about what has happened to your character. At the very end, you then get to write down like things like personal goals, but the mechanical information is chosen from lists of experiences the character has been through, which is ideologically one of those ideas that like, you know, people are the sums of their experiences. And that's an interesting thing. Like you don't often see that um, in a lot of other games. There is a certain element of there is some stuff about the character that is immutable and, and inflexible and they just always are the way they are. And in this, instead, it's much more focused on the idea that the characters have had experiences in their lives that have shaped them into the characters that they are today. Basically, this is a world without destiny or specialness in that regard. Uh, you are always a connected element to the circumstances that brought you about. Now, as far as like uh, what we would eventually call leveling up or advancement or experience or stuff like that, um, character creation is on page 22. The idea of advancing the character is explained on page 324. This game doesn't want to put an emphasis on leveling up or looking at your starter character in terms of like, look at all this cool stuff that I'll be able to do eventually, even when I put all the pieces together. A lot of the stuff you get in that opening character area as well is, is much more about small bonuses or things that set a general tone or a total set of style. Uh, to use Blades in the Dark as another comparison, Blades in the Dark has this same system of like small advancements that you get over time that like, you know, special abilities, but those special abilities tend to be about making a scene, like a specific narrative moment that le lets you interpret things. Whereas the Hardwind Island character creation is much more uh, adding small advantages and disadvantages overall over time. It feels a lot more like a skill system. The game does uh, seem to position combat as a last resort and sees killing people as just fundamentally avoidable. Like the idea that you have to kill someone or that you may kill someone creates like in the narrative text this sort of like, well, if you've got no other alternative, or well, I guess fighting people does open the door to killing people. So uh, ideologically, it seems that this game doesn't want solving problems to be done through violence. It doesn't seem to want the idea that uh, in this crime-based setting that violence is something that the characters should necessarily view as one of their predominant tools. One thing the rulebook does a lot of pretty consistently is underscore what it's not, what the narrative is not about, what you shouldn't see in the metaphor of this particular type of character, what you won't get, what you can't have. So there's a lot of boundary setting, which is understandable. Again, ideologically speaking, this is a game that wants to make sure you don't confuse it for something else. It does not want you to treat cyborgs as apartheid metaphors. Uh, the game has a mechanic for, effectively, it's it's your financial limitations, and it's a mechanic called burden. Now, as far as game language goes, I think burden is excellent. I think that it's a really good way to like drive home what uh, economic obligations and a lack of funding ultimately works as. Normally, you would see money typically treated as instead a, uh, a number that's up and debt as the number that is negative, whereas in Hardwired Island, no, your burden is this thing that grows. It's the positive number. It's the one that can go upwards into the sky. It's important that burden can only ever get worse or maybe get back to where it was. This is a very static setting as far as economic anxiety goes. Uh, nobody gets to win the lottery. Nobody advances out. Nobody ever takes over the gang and has all the money they need and achieves a change in the system during the game. In the same way that a lot of um, fairy stories get to the point of, and then they got married, and that's the end of the story where they lived happily ever after. It feels like getting out of debt 
is the happily ever after moment for Hardwide Island. You will maybe get that, but that's probably when your story's over. Now, I don't feel like reading Hardwide Island that I can see a lot of exciting ways to make a story in it. Not that it's not a place for good stories or anything like that, but I feel like this is a setting where there's the story, and that story is about the collapse of Grand Cross as a utopian project, and you get to make your way through it. The incoming election serves as a sort of star for the narrative orbits to go around. The problem of Grand Cross is capitalism, and the solution is not capitalism, and everything else is more or less bent around that change. What you do along the way will always be ultimately bent to that particular lodestar. Nonetheless, there is a strong player-first attitude. There's a lot of permissive uh, statements in the storytelling and in the design of how these systems work. It very much has this undercurrent of let players do cool things, don't punish players for trying things. That's good. I like that. Um, it does talk about fail-forward design as well. So if you're thinking about that, Ideologically speaking, this is a game that wants to make sure you don't mistake what it is. It wants to be simple and approachable. It doesn't see power advancement as being very important. And it is primarily focused on examining this grand project as it is affecting the lives of individual people. All right? I think that's a reasonable summary of the ideology of this game book as I read it. There is this idea of verisimilitude, which is not realism, but the feeling and semblance of realism. That is, you will often find that people believe unrealistic things because what really happens seems unrealistic. There is an excellent sense of verisimilitude about Hardwired Island, which is not to say that Hardwired Island is unrealistic, but rather that it conveys its idea and its vision of reality so well that when it wants to draw you into its reality, it does an excellent job of making that feel real. Now, that's its ideology. What about it as an actual book or something you can learn from? Let's go with some pros up first. Um, content warning up front. It has a content warning on, I think, the second or third page. I would need to actually handle a physical copy to know where it's positioned. It's in black and white. I mean, I would honestly prefer for it to have like a little red box around it or something to make it pop off that page. But I understand if the printing limitation means it can't be there. It is a good content warning. It lists the kind of stuff it's about. And it gives you an idea that, this, hey, this book is going to be about this stuff. So be aware of it. It doesn't just say contains stuff. It says contains these things. So bear that in mind when you talk to your players. That's, I think, an important extra step in content warnings. Um, when you're not limited by the text box of say Twitter, it's important to have the tools on hand to induce people to think about one another's impact. There is a section called the big issues section, which describes the two important things of the setting, which are the tech inequality and the upcoming elections. This is really good. Um, when you are about to create a character, you want to know what's important, what drives them, what's the world like that they're going to be inhabiting. And it wants to make sure that you know, before you start rolling on characters, that this is what's important. Now, I have berated uh, other lesser books for putting the character creation after a bunch of fluff. Um, but in this case, it's short, it's punchy, it's to the point, and it informs character. It gives you ideas for not how a character might do things, but how characters generally will see things. The setting has these things called dreamers, which is essentially rogue AI created by corporations, which give you something that is alien to work with, but but also something that continues the theme that what we found when we went to space was just more of us. And I assumed when I first saw them that there's going to be rules in the back of the book for getting to play one of them. Uh, I think the dreamers are a really cool idea. Um, there are some other things the book does on principle that are just really good ideas, like uh, sections of the book are written by other authors and they are credited on the page. That might not sound like much, but that is such a good idea and such a good thing. It means that you can directly accredit your own work. And it also means that when other people are looking through the book and going like, oh, I like this bit, they have someone they can turn to if they want to get more of the same. That's really cool. Uh, the book also has a splash page in the middle full of ads, which I love. I know, I know this sounds amazing uh, to say like, oh, I'm really glad they did ads. But it has a splash page of people who sponsored the book, who contributed money after the Kickstarter to make sure the book could be as good as it possibly could be. And I really love that. If you go back and look at any of the old D&D books, you'll find that they have two pages of ads in the front and the back anyway, which is like, you know, hey, buy more D&D products, which obviously D&D wants you to do that. But 
those pages never bothered me. And in this case, the page is used to do a great big piece of splash art and also show off cool logos. And it has that same kind of 90s anime feel. Um, I watched a lot of Transformers and I remember Grandu Sponsor. And I, and I said it before, but I'll say it again. The game book is gorgeous. This book is really, really pretty. It has an excellent color palette. It has a great aesthetic. The layout flows excellently well. There are a couple of places where it stands out as having mistakes in the layout, and that's because everything else is so frictionless. You will have this sudden moment of like, hang on, that looks wrong. Oh, that's why that's wrong, because you have been so far just gliding along in this excellently edited work. Um, and also, the book is full of jokes. Uh, it's very good at its kind of humor. This is a little awkward because, of course, I'm talking about the humor of a friend of mine. But there are jokes in every page. There's a lot of wording and phrases that are designed to make you laugh. And the jokes in question are aimed at good targets. There's a lot of uh, deliberately mixing the condescending and the crap. Now, uh, onto some cons, some some nitpicks, some, some provisos. Um, I'm not wild about the use of bullshit as a game language thing. I'm not saying that the book shouldn't have bullshit in it. I'm saying that as a term that a player is induced to say so that they can use the abilities on their sheet, bullshit feels like an unnecessary barrier. There are some people who are not as comfortable using swears so freely, even if they're okay with other people using them around them. And I just feel like making one of your game actions like, oh yes, you have to do a bullshit roll. It creates a tension that doesn't need to be there. Also, the language of the game uh, outlines that ideology from before. And, you know, one of the, one of the origin points a character can have is gamer. And the advantage you get for being a gamer is that it suggests that you adapt to new situations readily. And I think that as far as ideological positions go, uh, that's a that that's a very interesting example of what you think is a reasonable representation of gamer cultures and attitudes. That's very interesting. It's here under the con section because I don't agree. Um, the game the game language is actually full of these little wrinkles as well, like um. You can have an activist as a trait, and you can have the activist origin. And I just know that that's because the kind of people who would go, eh, eh, look, I'm an activist activist. And, like, I can just imagine the grin I'd be getting for that. And I think that's bad game language. I think that that's ambiguating a situation. Oh, I'm using this activist thing. Or, oh, no, my character is activist. Oh, do you mean activist? Or do you mean activ activist? Or do you mean the other activist? Like, that kind of thing feels like bad handling of language. Uh, there is a very minor mismatch between rolling high and low. Sometimes you want to roll high. Um, you sometimes want to roll low. Like Economic Shock, you want to roll low. Uh, normally, that's the kind of thing that other game systems might handle by saying that the storyteller is the one who's doing the roll, so they want to roll high if they want to hit you with it. But in this case, it, it doesn't work that way. And like it's just one of the things I dislike. If your system is elegant and simple, I prefer that it iterates smoothly on everything it's doing and not change gears like uh, Similarly, on the note of uh, uh, rolling, the game describes failing in like page 15 and it doesn't explain fail forward mentality until page 315 so you have this entire idea that the system has a hard no stop in the early sections and then it goes to the storyteller at the end of the book and says oh by the way you should make sure that that hard no is never a you know hard stop for the narrative that's just a that feels a little awkward i find that fail forward works better when the players know that they're doing it so that they can buy into it and that helps them shape the ways that they are going to fail so that they can at least provide some input and as you know it stops things like well why can't i just retry picking the lock kind of thing and okay so the character advancement session is depressing both in its vagueness and in how brief it is you get one XP when you hit a milestone, which is defined as something noteworthy. The only qualification is it makes a difference to someone. That's that's really, really ambiguous, and it bothers me. Uh, the rulebook is balanced around you doing this twice a session, which also seemed really counterintuitive to me. In, say, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, you wouldn't get two or three combats done every session. You would probably get one done maybe one done every two sessions kind of thing because not every game is always about combat. So Milestone feels like something where someone has eyeballed it. They have in their, their, their heart of hearts, they know what a milestone is and they figure you'll figure it out. And that feels like really sloppy rules when the rest of them are typically designed to be so elegant. Also on this advancement page, it gives me the absolute shits 
by giving the suggestion, you can ignore this system and come up with your own. This this is the kind of thing that when a game book does it, especially in a section of the rules that's already sparse, it just immediately sets me off into teacher mode. Yes, I could do that on my own. I am quite capable, but you're the expert being paid for your work and I would hope you have something good. Hard Red Cross, see me after class. But that's just the, that's it. That's basically it for my nitpicks, right? That's the stuff that I would actually say, hey, look, you should probably do something about this if I'd been involved earlier on in the, in the writing process, which obviously I wasn't because I'm just a backer. By volume, this game book is about 75% setting and about 25% rules. Now, that's literally an agnostic statement. That, that is not a good thing or a bad thing. If you are interested in a lot of setting information, this game gives you a lot of setting information, and it is all very thorough. If you're looking for something with, like, say, large monster directories or elaborate spell systems or tech or hacking systems, this isn't going to be your jam. This isn't going to provide you that kind of thing. This game is much more of uh, that fluid lightness. It wants you to be able to get playing and keep playing without as much referencing to the rule book. Unless what you're referencing is, hey, how is life like? What does it feel like? And that's an interesting thing because that can result in like a very different kind of sitting around the table and arguing about things. You might find, and I, I think Hardwired Island would be great for this, that Hardwired Island is defined enough that you can talk about what is there and you can get a clear vibe of what is there and players will world build off one another about their little sections of it as they sit around the table talking about the game in this way. Hypothetically, that's the thing that I think Hardwired Island would excel at. And that's something I really love, so I hope it does a good job with it. In the rulebook, you're going to get Politics, gangs, geography, economy, ecology, detailed maps of locations and their interactions. There's a passage of immersive fiction. There's stuff that sets the tone and wants you to see the characters in their spaces. And that wants you to see things like you. Things that have a feeling or a vibe that you can relate to. It is, simply put, a great RPG. It looks great. It has a lot of really good ideas. It is deeply enmeshed in its own setting, and it wants to entangle you in its ideas. If you are at all interested in the style Hardwired Island puts out, if you are curious about what really well-made indie press games can look like, if you are interested in systems that express their ideology clearly, if you are interested in politics in game design, you should get this book and check it out and talk about it with your friends. There's this quote in the book, the thing about working towards a better world is that the work is never done. There's always someone else who needs help, or a community in need, or whatever. If we ever did get a handle on it all, some genius is going to have a new idea that lights everything on fire again. But things still get better, so keep doing the work. If you do it right, you'll leave the world in a better place than you found it. It's a good quote. It's about how in the world, there's always going to be more problems that need solving and that things do get better through our effort. It is the ambition of this cyberpunk RPG that you'll see how things suck, the way the game sucks and is rigged against you. And maybe you can make things slightly better before you die, but it may require you to kill vast systems that you assumed were immutable from the day you were born. And in the game, you get to do that too.